Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome to the Arturia Mini V4 tutorial. Today we're going to take a look at the advanced screen. Now, none of this existed inside the original Mini Moog. This is Arturia's enhancement to the original machine, so we are going off piste a little bit, but there is some great stuff in here, and it really brings the Mini Moog into the 21st century. Hope you enjoy this video today. Uh, if you do, check out the Patreon and channel member links below. Fabulous way to help support my channel so that I can carry on making these videos. Now we're going to spend the majority of our time today in the first of three tabs. The Mod and ARP tab has by far the most interesting stuff. The Keyboard tab is so self-explanatory, I don't want to spend too long dwelling on it, but it's essentially where you map these major settings, velocity, after touch, etc two other destinations somewhere in the system. So as you can see, you've got three optional outputs for each of these controls. You can also see that the modulation wheel is mapped by default to a value, the mod amount, which we saw when we dealt with the oscillators um, in episode one of this series, we saw that there's a, a modulation controller that allows us to modulate um, oscillator and filter controls from either oscillator three or the noise module. That's actually plumbed in by default in these advanced screens. If you didn't want that, you would simply double click on this mod amount to take that away. We could also introduce, for example, a secondary keyboard tracking rather than using the keyboard control knobs in the main interface, which provide a one third, two thirds um, enhancement or keyboard follow to our filter bank. We could use this keyboard tracking section in the advanced page to do a similar kind of thing by mapping keyboard tracking to filter cutoff. Just before we leave this screen, I'll give you one tiny actual demonstration. Let's map after touch to filter cutoff. So I'm going to bring the cutoff frequency down from its maximum value and introduce a modulation amount. So now the standard sound when I pr uh, pr press a key on the keyboard is going to be determined by the cutoff frequency. But now when I press into the after touch, there's the filter cutoff being modulated by this much depending on how much I press into the aftertouch. So we have a sloping scale here where we can determine how sensitive the aftertouch key uh, pressing into the aftertouch, the spongy bit of your keyboard. And this is the minimum to maximum range. We also have a couple of optional modulation points simply by clicking in this screen. We can generate fairly complex uh, modulation amounts depending on the minimum amount of aftertouch you press over here, the maximum amount up here. And if you want to do something that crazy, be my guest. Let's press into the aftertouch and hear that, uh, hear that going. See that red line tracking with wherever the current aftertouch value is. Quite a cool effect, actually. Let's throw all that away and get back to our default sound. There are lots of effects units. You can have three of them uh, in action at any time. And here they all are. Very straightforward stuff. I'm not going to go into those today. Instead, let's get to the mod ARP screen because this is where the good stuff is. So we have three tabs across the top, LFO and function are activated by default. The arpeggiator is inactive by default. We'll get to that later. I'm also going to disable function just to keep everything really, really clean. So what we're currently looking at here is the low frequency oscillator. This is an advanced low frequency oscillator, nothing to do with oscillator three, which traditionally used to do this job. This now gives you the option, often bemoaned by Moog uh, owners over the years, of having three dedicated tonal oscillators in the main machine, and you use the LFO for what oscillator three used to do. Now, because this is a, an Arturia-based enhancement, they're free to do whatever they want. So as you can see, we have more preset options for the choices of LFOs to, to, uh, to select than we do in the primary interface, a pure sine wave, for instance, that the original Mini Moog couldn't do. Let's start off nice and simple by using our good old friend filter cutoff to demonstrate this, and it's very straightforward. Filter cutoff amount is dialed in with our amount knob. And now when I press a key on the keyboard, speed it up a bit. Now at the moment, that low frequency oscillator is freely cycling. Every time I press a key on the keyboard, it has no interaction with me. If I engage LFO retrig, however, we come out of free flowing LFO mode and now we're in retrig mode. I'll slow it down a little bit. So now every time I press a key on the keyboard, we start drawing the LFO from scratch. 
This gives us the option to use the LFO a little bit like a pseudo envelope. So we could effectively have an attack and decay. And a nice example of this is to dial up a triangle wave, which as you can see, starts basically in the middle of the modulation zone. But if we increase the phase to 270 degrees, we basically shift this triangle forwards or backwards in time. And at 270, we're gonna start at the very bottom of the modulation curve. So that effectively gives us a ramp, but then we'll come back down again. So every time I press a key, because we're re-triggering, we get effectively an envelope, but it's a repeating envelope. It's gonna loop around again and again. What if we don't want it to loop around again and again? Well, we can effectively take it out of low frequency oscillator mode. This now becomes a lie because we've now generated an envelope instead. We're gonna go on this journey once, and when we get to the end, we'll stop. The modulation amounts dialed in on this journey are primarily determined by our amount knob, the destination amount control here. However, the LFO is actually bipolar, which means the standard we're dealing with filter cutoff here, the actual value dialed in on the knob is at halfway. So all of the stuff below this kind of imaginary halfway line is going to subtract from the cutoff frequency and everything above is going to enhance it. You can prove that very simply by disabling the filter amount. And we listen to kind of how dull that sound is. You can kind of get an idea of it in the spectrum analyzer. Now, when I reintroduce filter amount, when I first press the key, it's going to be duller than that sound. And then it kind of blooms to the point where it temporarily meets it and then it goes through it. We can take it out of bipolar mode by pressing unipolar. No visible evidence occurs that anything's actually happened, but now every single one of these modulation amounts is positive. So when I press that key again, we're gonna start off with the shape that we had, this thing, the fairly 45 degree kind of diagonal, but all of the modulation amount is gonna be positive. The filter, filter cutoff will be pushed north. And as we come back down, you can see we settle out at where we started. Turn it back into looping mode. And we get that periodic sweep. A couple of options at the end of the preset selector um, require mention. Let's deal with sample and hold first, which is the, uh, the misshapen pulse wave symbol. Basically what's gonna happen now is that each iteration of the low frequency oscillator, the Moog will internally choose a new, a new modulation amount and it's random. So as you can see, this thing is jumping up and down. There's no way to predict what the next modulation amount is gonna be. Quick listen to that. So I've sped it up there so that it's modulating very quickly and choosing a new random cutoff value quite often. Let's go, take, go back into bipolar mode. We have a smoothed version of that as well, which is the smooth sample and hold, which is this option here. And now similar kind of thing, but as you can see, slow it down a little bit. It's blurring from one modulation amount into the next, so we never get those staggered um, violent jumps. The final option, polyphonic, very rarely gets used because predominantly the Minimoog is essentially supposed to be a, a mono instrument, mono legato down at the bottom tells you that it currently is. If, however, we switch into polyphonic mode, so then I can now play a chord. I'm just going to temporarily disable this low frequency oscillator. I'll turn it off from the power button. Let me just play a chord. Okay, so I'm playing three notes simultaneously there. If I engage polyphonic and um, low frequency oscillator mode, it means that each one of those notes that get, get played is going to have its own completely independent filter sweep. It effectively becomes impossible at this point to visually track what's going on because each one of those notes is going to have its own totally independent and um, low frequency oscillating um, cycle. Slow it down sufficiently so that we can actually track this stuff. So there's my first note. 
Now the second note that I played was at a different point. And now you can hear each one of those notes modulating independently. If we take it out of polyphonic mode, and do exactly the same thing. There's my first note. There's my second note. Play the third note in the middle of those two. There. All three of those notes are being subjected to the same um, LFO cycle. They're all going uh, cut off north and cut off south simultaneously. Monophonic uh, low frequency oscillation is much the most common of the two because you get that synchronized, everything working together kind of thing. But if you want more chaos, by all means, engage polyphonic mode. Good stuff. Let's throw all of those changes away. And now we'll have a look at the function page. Now it occupies the same real estate as the LFO page. You can see two thirds of this advanced screen are basically split between these two functions. So when you select the function page, you get a new set of options visible to you, but it looks very similar to the to LFO mode. And as I toggle between LFO and function, you can see that the controls are independent. They're, they've got different options now. The LFO is still running in retrig, functions running in free flowing. But what the function screen allows you to do is effectively draw a user defined low frequency oscillator. So now instead of having simple shapes, we have complex shapes. These presets are literally starting points. So that's a sawtooth for instance, but I can now edit that sawtooth to my heart's content simply by clicking in the function area. And now I'm making increasingly complex um, modulation curves. I've also got these modulation amount adjusters in between each one of the modulation points. Oh, just created a new one there by accident. Other than the fact that it's a complex wave shape, it's actually doing exactly the same job. We map it to a destination in exactly the same way that we did with the LFO. And if I bring the cutoff frequency down again and dial in filter cutoff, now you can hear each, each time it gets to the end of the function, we had that kind of sharp jump, but it's easy enough to pull in the second node and now you'll see that the start and end do properly track. So we do have a kind of wraparound function here. So just make sure this second node isn't vertical if you want a, a smooth transition from the end of the, uh, the last function back around to the beginning of the new one. We also have some really nice draw mode options. This stuff is really useful and produces really surprisingly musical results Let's try steps first. Now I'm gonna get a pencil tool, as you can see. Now when I drag around the function page, I'm gonna get a very different kind of thing. It's basically drawing in steps. Very similar to the kind of sample and hold effect we had earlier, but we're in complete control of how that modulation happens. We also have ramp uh, options. So now when I draw with the pencil tool, I'm going to get very nice effects. So that's an upward ramp and down ramp. Gives you a really kind of nice staccato sound. Six million dollar man. If you're as old as me, you remember the bionic man. That was the sound effect you used to get when he used his super eye. Excellent stuff. Let's throw all that away. And finally, we'll have a look at the arpeggiator. So by default, it's off, but it's just another engageable option, just like the other two were. It does, however, have its own dedicated real estate in the advanced page. So now that this arpeggiator is active, let's play a chord and see what we're going to get. So there's a C major being played. You can see it's broken up the chord and it's playing each note individually. The options below specify how that arpeggiator is going to operate. So at the moment, we're only working over a single octave. Let's go up to two octaves, just basically click and drag in the number. And now you get a visual representation of what those notes are going to sound like. Let's hear it. At the 
moment each one of those notes is playing for the entire time. So we've basically got noise all of the time. If we bring the gate value down, let's set it to 50%. Now each one of the notes, I'll just right click to fine, fine tune that. Each one of those notes is going to, uh, only going to occupy half the amount of time. And if we have a repeat of two, plays each note twice. Everything's going up at the moment because the arpeggiator is set in up mode, but we have more interesting stuff to choose from. Up and down exclusive is probably the classic arpeggiator behavior. This means at the top of the range, the maximum and minimum notes are only ever played once. I'll just take it down to repeat one again. Let's speed it up a bit and it'll sound a bit more interesting. A far less often used option is inclusive and now the upper and lower notes are played twice. That's all very well and good. Using the arpeggiator that way is pretty straightforward. But if you have a browse through some of the presets, you'll see the arpeggiator being used in much more musically creative ways. Just, just by way of example, let's load up the butterfly effect sound. And now we have a very nice interaction between the function page and the arpeggiator. So we've already dealt with them independently. We kind of know what they do. But have a look at how the function page is being used in this context. It's mapped as its destination to the arpeggiator rate and gate functions, which means for half the time, the arpeggiator is faster than the other half of the time. The function is alternating between a fast arpeggiator and a slow arpeggiator. I'll just play a single note on the keyboard and hopefully you'll be able to track what's happening. So sometimes the arpeggiator is playing quickly and sometimes it's playing slowly. I think that's a really, really nice creative use of the arpeggiator as a modulation so as a modulation destination. So the function is mapping into the arpeggiator to dynamically modulate its rate and its gate. While we're having a look at this preset, let's jump briefly over to the low frequency oscillator because it's doing some cool stuff as well. So the low frequency oscillator in this preset is mapped to two of the effects, but two different kinds of effects, um, delay effects in this sound. Let's jump over and have a look at them. We have a pitch shifting delay, which basically means that when it delays, however, however much the, the delay amount is set to, it's going to not, not only pitch shift 12 semitones, but this spray control, which is set to maximum, is effectively going to randomize that pitch as well. So it's going to be quite a chaotic sound. On the other hand, we have a far more traditional simple delay, a ping pong delay, which is basically just going to repeat. So we have these two delays playing against each other. And then in the advanced page, we're mapping a low frequency oscillator into them. So I'll play this single note again, and you'll hear that when we're at the top of the curve, the, the pitch shifted notes, which are gonna be higher than normal, will come in. And we're at, when we're at the bottom of the curve, they'll disappear and you'll get a more traditional delay sound. Here we go. When we're at the top of that curve, you get those bright, sparkling notes, and then they disappear. Down at the bottom of the curve, a much more traditional sounding delay. Really, really nice sound design, and a nice example of all three of these advanced functions being used in harmony. And that'll do us for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Please hit like if you did. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Helps me out with all the YouTube stuff. I'll see you again. Thanks very much.